Hello and welcome back. I'm your host, Phil Biadron. Joining me is editor Charles Unger. Thanks for uh, being here. Thanks, Phil, for having me. So uh, let's say I wanted to get into editing. How would I become an editor? Great question. <laughs> um, there's two paths you can take. One path is, you know, with all this digital technology, you can start editing your own shorts. You can start editing friends' shorts. Okay. You can call yourself an editor right off the bat, really. Um, just make something on your iPhone or whatever mobile device mm -hmm. you have and put it in your computer and start working on it. Um, you know, we haven't even touched this. I know that you mentioned there's another path, but how do I edit? Is there like some software available or uh, is an app? Like, <laughs> how, do you, how do you edit digitally? Uh, there's tons of different software levels, um, more amateur, more professional. Uh, for example, iMovie is available on all the uh, iPhones. You can right. use iMovie. People, mm -hmm. uh, beginners have used that. Um, there's also Final Cut Pro, which Apple also sponsored, uh, or created rather. And then there's Premiere Pro, Pro which is now becoming the more uh, professional and uh, becoming a challenge to Avid. Now, Avid mm -hmm. is the industry pro. When people ask me what the difference is between the softwares, I say, well, Avid is perfect because it's mm -hmm. the uh, premier editing system. That's a bad example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're it's, an Avid supporter of Premiere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see I used two <laughs> words there. Yeah. No, but Avid is great because it's best uh, because you can use multiple editors to access you know, the same footage right. at the same time. Premiere hasn't quite got up to that speed yet. Great. Um, so the big features are all done on Avid. So okay. that's so made major TV shows and major films, Avid is the industry standard. That's and what like I tell you said, people. if you have multiple editors, you could make your cut, throw it up in the, the whatever community collective workspace and someone else could pull it down, keep editing and throw it back up there, right? Yeah, they, uh, they share servers, okay. you know. So a server is a, a device that has all the media mm -hmm. and then each editor can access that server and access that footage. And mm -hmm. the only issue is that they can't work on the same sequence at the same time. Okay. Yeah. So, um, Which probably isn't a good idea no. anyway. <laughs> yeah, because then you're changing the same sequence as somebody else is changing. But, but, so, but if I wanted to be an editor, I could go out and buy some of the software and I could teach myself. Of like, I don't know, are there courses in Avid? I've, heard, I've always heard that Avid is probably the most advanced and less user-friendly version of editing software as opposed to iMovie, which is pretty user-friendly. Am I correct on this? I'll yeah, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of history. Um, Avid was the first big program mm -hmm. to be adapted after uh, film, cutting on film, went right. away. So in the mid-90s, um, they got together and they asked a bunch of editors, now can you take the controls on your normal, you know, film devices and transpose them into Avid. What would you like to see in a nonlinear program? So the editors got together mm -hmm. and with the company Avid, they created Avid. Oh, wow. And Avid okay. became the go-to for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, then Final Cut Pro came in towards the end of the 90s and into the early 2000s and revolutionized things. And mm. because it was able to be done uh, at your home on a desktop with small drive space, it started giving um, Avid a run for its money. Mm -hmm. um, and then sort of Avid sort of adapted to that. Um, Final Cut Pro went sort of away because they were trying to get into more consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Premiere sort of took its place. That's by Adobe, correct? The correct. Yeah. yeah. So now it's really, you know, Premiere for smaller projects. Um, and then Avid for larger projects. So mm -hmm. I told you that was the first way that right. you could become an editor, which mm -hmm. is just start doing what it is you want to do. If you want to edit, start editing. And the second way is to go through the industry, which is kind of the way I went. Mm -hmm. um, you get uh, a post PA. Um, a post PA is a right. you know production assistant, but um, you're in the you know uh, post production, um, and so you would get you know, get a coffee or you would help out the uh, the editorial staff. Mm -hmm. um, if you're lucky, you can get into an apprentice editor. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the beginning bottom right. level. Can we cover that a little bit? Yeah, mm -hmm. apprentice editor is kind of how I got in. Um, and then you can move up to assistant, and then you move up to editorial, you know, okay. editor rather. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you can take a sidetrack and you can go from assistant editor up to post super. Um, right. And some people have done that as well. Post Super kind of just kind of organizes everybody and helps with deliverables and, and that kind of thing. Okay. 
All so, right, cool. So, or you could go to New York, do animation, and then get involved with Double Dragon. You know, so there's a thousand ways of going about it, right? <laughs> there is, and, and I think it's a little bit overwhelming to new yeah. people because mm. everybody will tell you a different story on sure. how they got into the industry. Mm. Um, but it just it ends up, you know, whatever resource you have access to, use that, you know? Right. Um, so you, you had mentioned that you, uh, you teach as well. You mentioned your students a little bit. So you teach film editing, uh, and if so, what kind of education is required or beneficial if you want to become an editor? Um, it's like everything else. You can take classes in editing, mm -hmm. or you can just study movies and you know get into the industry. Okay. Um, do it yourself, kind of thing. Every everyone's different, you know. You mentioned that great book, uh, Walter Murch. What was that called? Yeah, in the blink Wal of an eye. Ex exactly. Yeah. Walter Murch in the blink of an eye is a great book. It talks about theory and editing, mm -hmm. not so much the mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, I would say in teaching editing, the two things that are, you know, the major things are one, the aesthetics of editing. What makes for a good cut? We talked a little bit about that before. And then, of course, the other side is how do you run these nonlinear programs? Mm -hmm. um, do you have you know, enough drive space? All the technical things, you mm -hmm. know, what buttons to push. And unfortunately, in my opinion, a lot of the industry and, and outsiders look at editing as purely technical. And right. although it is, I think that students can pick that up very easily. But what I think they can't pick up is the aesthetics. What makes a cut work and yeah. what makes it not work and why? Do, do you think that? In order to become an editor, some people are born with like a, a, a nice rhythm or an eye for it, or is that something that can be learned, or is it just like a natural skill that you may possess? Well, it's interesting because in post-production, mm -hmm. a lot of the people, not only in editing, but in sound, are musicians. Oh, okay. Because of exactly what you just said. Yeah. They have an internal sense of rhythm, mm -hmm. and I find that that's almost impossible to teach, really. You can teach the technical, you can teach uh, theory on what makes a good cut, but if you don't have an internal sense of rhythm and how a scene should flow and when you cut mm -hmm. and when you don't, then it, it's a little tough. Um, a lot of times you can use temp music. This is music that you don't have the rights to, but you mm -hmm. can put it in because music has an internal rhythm. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that a lot of times you start cutting a scene to that temp rhythm mm -hmm. and it really flows better. So that's what I, I tell uh -huh. my students that don't have such a good grasp on rhythm right. is put in a piece of music and cut to the rhythm of that. Oh, okay. In general, yeah. don't yeah. follow it on beat for beat, but right. use that as a template. Yeah, speaking of, so what are some common mistakes that you see young or inexperienced editors do? One thing is that they worry too much about continuity. Okay. You know, I can't tell you how many times I'll say, okay, just make this cut, and they'll say, take a look at this. What's wrong with it? And I'm like, uh, it works. It's nothing wrong. But no, but this hand didn't match the oh. other hand yeah. in the next cut, and mm -hmm. it's, it's different. And they get obsessed with matching continuity. And Interesting. Okay. I, I would think just the opposite with students. I think they would throw that away in favor of the cool action sequence or whatever well, that they're going for. Yeah, continuity is the easiest thing to teach sure. in film school. So students kind of get hung up on it mm -hmm. because it's it's something that you should try to match. You know, it's they editors and editor teaching ed, teaching editing. You say try to match it. Try to make it work. You know from cut to cut as best you can, but when you can't, you have to use those tricks to direct or misdirect your right. eye so that you don't see it. Uh -huh. um, but what I don't like is when you have too quick editing, and there's a lot of that in Hollywood, where right. it's so quick and flashy that you don't know where you are. Um, I'm a big believer in geography. Geography mm -hmm. is basically you show a master shot and then you move in for tighter coverage. Like an establishing shot, would that be the same thing? So it will say Los Angeles 2018 and you get a shot of the skyline that we punch into the exterior of the building and then we're in the office or whatever. Yeah, um, it, and, and as you go closer and closer so and closer, mm -hmm. I, I usually tell students don't cut to um, a close-up if somebody is moving out of the essential area that you've established as an editor. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if, you're, if you would get up and walk away, suddenly I would say, well, cut to a master shot because master shots reveal geography. Got it. And an and audience has to be reoriented anytime somebody moves. But sometimes there's a tendency to keep on tighter shots, especially in action scenes, mm -hmm. where um, they just want to confuse the audience. And mm -hmm. we've all seen films like that, where you don't quite know where you are geography-wise, and right. you're over here, you're over here, but it's yeah. okay because all of a sudden here's a quick cut, and it's a flash, and blah, blah, blah. And I don't like that kind of editing. Right. I think that's manipulative, and I think that it's sort of cheating. Yeah, maybe it's like a boxing thing, and 
we're getting thrown around trying to show how the boxer is getting punched, maybe, you know, so it could be used for that effect. But as you mentioned, um, it, what's the principle called? It's cutting on, um, editing on the action, for instance, to say I'm grabbing a glass of water. You want to cut like midway through the action to the other shot. Uh, why is that a thing? Why not just keep it all in, in one shot? That would take care of my continuity issue, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very good point. It's called, uh, one of the terms is matching on action. Matching on action. Matching on action yeah, is yeah. basically uh, what you want to do is double the action, right? So okay. if, if we were in a big master shot mm -hmm. and we had you come in and sit down, right? Sure. So when we shot your close up, mm -hmm. we would have you step into frame and sit down, right? Okay. Because if you were just sitting down, we would have a problem cutting from a master of you sitting to a tighter shot of you sitting. Okay. So it, in other words, uh, a cut is easier to accept if there's an overlapping action. So that's another ah, term, Okay. overlapping action. And that's just what we're used to as humans seeing. We're used right. to seeing that, yeah. Okay. And, and the ir irony is that we cheat. So a lot of yeah. times we would back up a couple of frames of you yeah. about to sit versus mm -hmm the exact moment where you're sitting you know, yeah. or starting to sit, right. that, if that makes sense. And it's also helpful if you've got a good actor who can match their own action and, and know it every time, you know. So, yeah, uh, like which hand did you use to pick <laughs> up the glass? Yeah, especially with a multicam setup, you know. Um, so to switch gears a little bit, so we dug into a little bit about editing. So the editing skills that you have or the editing skills that one can possess and learn, how can these be applied to other jobs, maybe jobs not even in the entertainment industry? Do you feel like editing lends itself to other career paths? Um, yeah, I mean, in addition to editing for features mm -hmm. or TV, you can edit for web series. Uh, a lot of everything that's media needs an editor, unless it's even reality. You know, they, they need editors, don't they? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, editing is all over the place now. I was at the gas station putting gas in my car, and there's a little yeah, video, yeah, right? And I'm like, yeah. there's editing there too, you know? Yeah. So it's like, you can edit for any kind of platform, uh, any device, you know, and, and it's now even more in demand than ever. Sure. Um, so I, I, I think that editing is not just for features. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you want to go into features, of course, and I, I did, I was interested in stories. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that uh, some people like editing music videos, which is flashier, brings mm -hmm. more attention to it. I prefer editing for stories mm -hmm. and content and working with characters and actors yeah. and, and seeing how all that flows. To me, that's the big magic. It's, it's the invisible art, you know? And mm -hmm. I always say to my students, look, if you're looking for attention and acclaim, don't get it in editing. <laughs> 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 Be something else. But uh, no, and uh, editing also is a very good teaching mechanism for other uh, arts. So if you want to move on to directing, mm -hmm. they say that directors usually come from writers, mm -hmm. actors, or editors. Okay. Because those are the three skills you really need. Uh, and when I say acting, I mean you have to be able to judge performance if you're mm -hmm. an editor um, and a director. So um, I've directed a few th uh, films as well, and the editing skills I learned has helped me as a director because I know exactly the shots I need. Mm -hmm. Because the worst thing in the world as for, for a director like me is to be in the editing room and saying, oh, I wish I had this shot. Yeah. Why didn't I get this? Why didn't I get that? Yeah. And so as an editor, um, you get those shots because you see it in your head. So and you're, you're editing as you're filming. Yeah. So you avoid your overshooting, which you know a lot of young and experienced filmmakers just keep the camera rolling. It's digital. The editor will figure it out. You know, <laughs> that can be a problem, and that could lead to a long post-production period. However, uh, one of the jobs you said is directing, and that came from your experience as an editor, right? So why don't we delve into that a little bit more? So what has been your experience directing features, or um, how did you get in interested and involved in that? Um, I've always wanted to be a director, mm -hmm. um, and I sort of uh, started writing stories so that I could direct them. Mm -hmm. um, but directing has also been um, a culmination of all of the th interests of mine within film and otherwise. Yeah. Uh, for example, animation. Yeah, let's um, bring that back. So you mentioned animation. You got your, your, your teeth cut in New York, you know, doing the cell block or whatever <laughs> whatever it was called yeah it's pixelation uh -huh. it's it's uh you know you're moving your action figures one frame or two frames at a time yeah. um but that really made you pre-visualize you know mm -hmm. and, and directing is a lot of pre-visualization mm -hmm. you have to see the movie play in your head yeah. and especially when you're in animation you don't have time to get extra shots that you think will just be thrown out everything right. you do is going to end up in the cut so it forces you to pre-plan Got it. And so as an animator back in the day, um, everything I used, I would, you know, what would be called now uh, cutting in camera. So I would be cutting this in my head mm -hmm. as we were going along. Yeah. And then in my 
uh, jobs as an editor, I would be um, seeing what works and seeing mm -hmm. what shots really help. And so then when I would go on the set, I would remember to get those shots and, and have options. You mm -hmm. know, I think it's a careful balance directing between getting the shots you need, but then giving yourself a little bit of extra mm -hmm. to, to let actors go off and, and try different things. You know, you sure. don't want to just be, let's just get this, let's just get this. You, you want to be a little bit more open. Mm -hmm. um, I find that as a director, I like to come with uh, a plan to the set. Mm -hmm. Let's get this shot and that shot, but then be willing to throw it out. Oh, okay. And I, and I think all the arts benefit from this combination mm -hmm. of a solid plan versus mm -hmm. being spontane uh, spontaneous. Okay. So speaking of, uh, what, are you, what are you currently working on? I'm currently working on a film called My Apocalyptic Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. It's my third feature film. Cool. Um, this was one I did not uh, write. I directed and produced it based on a, a, a friend's script. Richard mm -hmm. wrote it for, uh, for his, you know, potential to, to be doing it as an independent film, and mm -hmm. he asked me to direct it, and, uh, and you're in it as well. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah, we cast you. <laughs> uh, so it's about a special needs um, adult uh -huh. that goes on uh, this search for his natural mother mm -hmm. when his uh, foster mother dies at his group home. Mm -hmm. And uh, it leads him kind of on a Wizard of Oz type epic journey where he befriends a Korean family and yep. then they bring him in, they help him, uh, give him money, and he eventually finds his mom and discovers that along the way he's found a new family and doesn't need his mom. And so it's a discovery path for him. But Got it. The angle that's unique about this film is that this uh, special needs adult who is named Marcus is uh, obsessed with this zombie TV show called Apocalyptic Zombies. So he watches this TV show mm -hmm. religiously and it sort of informs him and influences him. Uh, in fact, in the TV show, it's about a family that's broken apart and comes back together. So he imitates that in his real life. Got it. And so it's kind of cool because we're going to be cutting back and forth between the two, uh, what we call A story and B story. Oh, so B story would be like the actual like zombie footage? Yeah. Following the show? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The zombie footage that will be you know, in the movie and, and uh -huh. as well as them watching it on a TV. Got it. Um, so we recently completed a director's cut. Nice. Um, yeah. And, and now we all know what a director's cut is. <laughs> now we know what a director's cut is. Okay. And, and now it's my turn, and this was something we were talking about earlier, to take a step back. Here mm -hmm. on this film, I uh, am a director, so I have other people editing it because I want that objectivity. Sure. You know, I want to be able to look at what the editors do because they contribute a lot and say, okay, I like this, let's tweak this, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but if I was editing this for another director, then mm -hmm. it would be sort of a different story. I would just go in, I'd do the first pass. Yeah. And so I, I enjoy this. I don't feel um, like I have to be the editor if I'm the director. I did that on my first Got feature. Yeah, yeah. but. But now I'm with every feature. I'm starting to so move away. You can you can separate the two and have a healthy relationship between this time I'm the director, this time I'm the editor. But you also mentioned on this one you're the producer as well. So I guess you're still that ring up. So you and you have final approval of of how the film looks. Is that what that means? Oh well, yes. I mean the producer in the sense of a, I'm a creative producer on Got this. Okay. I've assembled a lot of the key crew and mm -hmm. cast friends of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I bring people together that I've worked with in the past two films that I've done, mm -hmm. Mr. Lucky and Come Together. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I also worked with Richard on the script a lot. And so mm -hmm. I see producing in this aspect on My Apocalyptic as more of a creative producer. Um, it's, it. it's, they were the ones that financed it. They technically mm -hmm. hired me, mm -hmm. um, Richard and uh, Holly Soriano, and um, they're the ones that will have ultimate final cut. Um, but you know, I'm bringing it to them in best shape as I can make it. Cool, well I look forward to seeing it when it comes out, partially because I'm in it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so a final question for yeah. you. Uh, is there any lasting advice that you'd like to give anyone who's interested in editing or even interested in this crazy business we call the entertainment industry? Um, advice. Well, I would just say follow your heart, you know. Um, mine started in, in animation mm -hmm. and it led me to editing and, mm -hmm. and directing. Uh, I would say never give up and I would say uh, whatever path you think you're going to take, be open to a different route. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, I started in animation right. and um, uh, I worked again in animation towards uh, most recently actually. Uh, my wife came up with this franchise called the Punky Pets. What was uh, that? Punky Pets is eight, anim uh, eight animated characters from around the world come together through music. And um, so she presented it to me and asked me to help her out. And um, together we produced several animated short films. Wow. Um, one went to Cannes Film Festival nice. in 2014. Wow. Um, and we also promoted it in a unique way. We promoted it through music. 
Um, through uh, our agent, we got to know uh, the head of the Warp Tour, Kevin Lyman, oh, and cool. yeah. he asked us to be a sponsor on the Warp Tour. So we went on the Warp Tour promoting Punky Pets. So we brought the booth on several uh, yeah. Warp Tour shows, and that was great. And we were also an exhibitor at Comic Con for several wow. years. And so uh, and this was great because. Punky Pets really utilized all of my skills mm -hmm. from animation. Right. I co-wrote some of the stories, mm -hmm. um, and then I, of course, directed it and edited it. So, you know, I would say, in summing all this up, mm -hmm. is don't be afraid to try different things in the industry. In other words, don't think that you have to completely specialize. Try a little bit of this, try yeah. a little bit of that, because chances are, at the end of the day, you'll end up using all of it. Mm -hmm. It's great advice. So once again, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Phil, for having me. Of course.